see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy, and I'm so pleased today to be here with uh, Christian Kiesers. Thank you, Christian, for joining me. Well, thank you for having this discussion with me. Yeah, so uh, you're a professor of, uh, of the social brain at the uh, Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience in Amsterdam. And you've uh, also written this book, which is behind you, The Empathic Brain, How the Discovery of neur uh, Mirror Neurons Changes Our Understanding of Human Nature. So what we want to do in this dialogue was maybe just uh, go through the different uh, chapters of your book um, and just kind of uh, hear it, hear what you have to say about it. And, but before we start, is there anything else you'd like to say by way of introduction? Well, not really. I mean, the, the book is summarizing a bit uh, all the research I've done over the last 10 years. So by going through the book, we'll as well go through, through my life's work. Oh, great. And another thing is, is you were also, had also worked at the University of, uh, I guess, no, at Parma, Italy, at the university there, where they actually discovered mirror neurons. So uh, you were right there in the heart of it. Yes, so, so that was really a very exciting time that uh, kind of set off most of the research I'm doing now. I was very fortunate to, to be part of that. Yeah, so what we thought we'd do is I actually, actually, I have it on the screen here, the different chapters. And so I can show <laughs> the uh, chapters and uh, we can kind of uh, just kind of uh, then kind of chat about it a little bit and go over it. That sounds great. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's uh, start here with um, the introduction. Uh, introduction here says uh, connecting people. Yes, yeah, so, so, so I think that the, the main spirit of this book is that we all know the fact that the humans have this almost uncanny capacity to feel what goes on in others. I mean, you, you can go to a wedding and you'll get incredibly emotional if you see the two you know, pairs basically feel very much about their own wedding. You'll get sad if, uh, if, if they're really sad, you get happy when they're happy. We go through that as well whenever we watch a good movie. So if you watch one of these cliffhanger movies where somebody's just holding off and falling off a roof, we kind of feel very, very much moved in part of what the, the other person is feeling. And I think what all of this book is about is to take this phenomenon that we all know, the phenomenon of empathy, and try to really look into the brain to try to see if we can understand how our brain allows us to do that, and then what it means for us, how our brain is capable of doing that. Yeah, you'd, uh, you'd started off uh, the book, I remember, with uh, the story of James Bond and the spider uh, crawling yes. up his arm and yes. how we feel that spider uh, crawling in the movie. Yeah, because I think when we, when we think about scenes like that with the tarantula on, on James Bond's chest, I think the, the really striking thing is that none of us needs to do much thinking to understand what Bond goes through. I mean, we can all kind of, we, we almost feel our own hands sweating, our heart beats stronger. We can maybe even feel a little itch on our shoulder. And kind of all of that just uh, happens. It's not like we have to think about it. And I think that's a, a very simple case that really illustrates how little empathy actually has to do with effortful, logical thinking. And, and I think this really sets us off to start taking seriously the fact that the brain is about more than just thinking. Okay, so um, then we have uh, chapter one, the uh, discovery of, of uh, mirror neurons. And I have here, is perception like a sandwich from seeing to doing brain function based on connections uh, between neurons and uh, some other um, headings here as well? Yeah, so, so, so I think what, the, what I tried to do in this book 
is that I don't just want the reader to believe what I think the mirror system is doing for us. What I try to do with you is basically take you by the hand, let you into my lab, let you see the work we actually do so that you can then draw your own conclusions about uh, how mirror neurons really change our understanding of, of human nature. And so what I'm doing in this uh, first trio chapter in the book is I, I take you in the lab while, uh, while mirror neurons are really being discovered. You there, you can listen to the activity of a single neuron in the monkey while either the monkey is grasping a peanut and while the monkey witnesses somebody else grasp a peanut. And, and you get to witness the way that the single neuron that everyone before thought would only be involved in the monkey's own action actually responds as well while the monkey simply sees somebody else do a similar action. And, and by showing you the behavior of these neurons and telling you some of the background of what we know what this brain area is actually doing, I'm kind of uh, letting you conclude yourself the fact that now while you see somebody else do an action like grasping this cup, for instance, and drink from it, it's no longer a matter of just seeing somebody else grasp the cup, but you go through the experience, kind of the, the way it saves you from mourning and tiredness. And, and, <laughs> and, and all of these intentions, they are not in what you can actually see, because you cannot see intentions, all you can see is the cup. But you then feel all of these intentions and the meaning in a very intuitive way, just because your brain makes you go through the actions that you see. And I think that's the, the core of what this first chapter is about. And we might mention, too, you talked about uh, the discovery of mirror neurons in uh, Parma, Italy. With, there was a research lab there. And they actually had individual neurons wired, Correct. as I understand it. And every time that, and they were motor neurons, and every time they fired, it made a sound. And then once, uh, and it was, and it was uh, macaque monkeys, is that right? Or, Correct, yes. And every time the monkey reached for, you said it was a raisin, I've heard so many different stories of what they were <laughs> reaching for. But you're saying that they would reach for a raisin, and then that neuron would, that uh, is involved in this motor action would fire and make a sound. And then once Correct. the researcher came in and and then they were reaching for it, and it's fired? Yes, so, so, so the thing was that uh, in, the, in, in the lab, what was being studied at that moment was actually not social perception at all. It, we, we basically had electrodes in these parts of the brain of the monkey to understand how the monkey controls his own action. That was the reason for these recordings. But what happens is that you simply put the, the output from that neuron on a loudspeaker all the time, so you hear kind of pop, 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 and then the monkey is grasping, and it goes brrrr, and then the monkey rests, it goes pop, 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 and then the, the monkey grasps another piece of food that you give him, and it goes brrrr again. So from that, people could understand, for instance, that this particular neuron is involved when the monkey wants to grasp something. Other neurons are active when the monkey, for instance, tries to tear something apart. And it was just by pure chance, because they always had the sound of the neuron in the background, that while well, they got hungry, for instance, and took one of these peanuts to eat it uh, themselves, they, they heard in the background how this neuron was firing, exactly as if the monkey was grasping the neuron itself. And so it, it's because this kind of experimental setup led them to, to, um, to listen to the neuron as well, not while the neuron, uh, the monkey was doing what people wanted to study, but something else, that they could really by chance discover this property. And, and then I joined the lab to, you know, because I was fascinated by this discovery, to, to try to really understand a bit better what these neurons were doing. Well, this is kind of, in terms of uh, understanding empathy, it seems that this uh, mirror neurons is like this, this foundational uh, discovery of how empathy works and it's like um, just it's so important to just understanding the whole uh, uh, process of empathy and experience of empathy. Yeah I think absolutely so the, the big thing is when when we think back about the the kind of 1990s 
the, the dominant theory was actually that somewhere in the brain we have a specialized part that's responsible for making sense of the mind of other people. So, so the notion was very much that we had a kind of sandwich, like I call it uh, in the first chapter, so that uh, if, um, if you kind of see your, your child fall down and cry and you decide to pick up the child, there's actually three separate phenomena. There's a, a foundational layer of bread, which is kind of seeing your child fall down and cry. Then there's the, the interesting part in the classic theory, so the kind of juicy meat, which is how you then go from seeing a, a baby cry to really understand that the child is distressed. And everyone was specialized, was trying to find the part of the brain that was this juicy bit, that was doing this kind of thinking about the mind of others. And then helping the child was considered to be a third separate layer of boring bread again, which is how your motor system then helps you pick up the child. And what marine neurons really show is that searching for this layer of meat where you think about others was actually a mistake. And that the, the two things, vision and action, are directly connected. And, and what happens in your brain is that you see your child cry and you don't have to think about what it means. You kind of automatically kind of map it onto your own pain. And by doing so, you automatically know what you want to do to, to kind of alleviate that pain if you hurt yourself. And then you simply apply that to you and to your child. So we take away the abstract thinking from the sandwich model. And, and we, we create a new vision of the brain in which not everything goes through abstract kind of logical thinking. And you have these very direct connections between seeing the social world and acting and, and, and helping other people. Empathy, basically, finally discovered in the brain. Yeah, this is, this is uh, so exciting. Um, so the, uh, is that so chapter one? Is, this, uh, is there more to chapter one that you'd like to cover? Or? No, I think chapter one is really about kind of letting you witness a mirror neuron in the lab. And, uh, and letting you kind of get a feeling for what it means. And then in chapter two, what I, what I really do is I kind of uh, show a little bit how that profoundly changes how most people were thinking of the brain. What I was saying basically, this fact that we, we kind of move out of this notion that the brain is about logical thinking. And we start to realize that some things that the brain does, for instance, uh, connecting me lift this cup, uh, the, the sight of me doing that, with your own motor program for, for, for grasping a cup, that this connection basically means that you have an intuition for what I feel while I take the cup. Because you know what you feel while you take your cup. So by connecting these two in the brain, we basically start to be able to understand the biology of intuitions, the biology of how we can feel what goes on in others without having to think about it. Yeah, what I like so much about your book is that you really get into the, uh, the mechanics of how it works. It's like the individual neurons, how the neurons yes. connect, how they uh, form together. And so it, it gives a, a and then how it, it that's kind of at the, the, the biological level, and then how it kind of, uh, um, how it just uh, works, like you're talking about it in, in what we're seeing. So when, when I pick up the cup, that you see, you, you're feeling me pick up the cup, and there's like a, you know that usually when you pick up the cup, that you continue on and drink something. So there's like a sense of intention that, oh, I'm, he's picking up the cup and he's going to drink something. So you already know in advance of what my actions are going to be. And, and the nice thing is that it's no longer just an abstract notion of that you, you can somehow abstractly anticipate. What we really show is that your, your own motor program, which we can understand really as a programming of an action, is your key to kind of feeling and decoding what the other person will do. It kind of takes out the mystery 
of how we 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 kind of are uh, feeling what goes on in others, and it replaces it with uh, with something very beautiful, I think, which is kind of starting to understand the nuts and the bolts of how we connect to other people. And I think rather than diminishing the beauty of it, it, it kind of increases it because we can now see how elegantly the brain solved this seemingly very complex problem. Yeah, it used to be the empathy was kind of like based on on maybe philosophy or mysticism. And this exactly. kind of it this kind of takes it out of that realm and puts it into the real nuts and bolts of how the human mind uh, works and the biology of it. And, and I think that by doing that, we actually understand a lot about uh, how we empathize with others and, 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 and what it means for us. And, and I think that's a little bit where the, the next two chapters are about, because in the beginning, uh, I, I start from the monkey and mirror neurons in the monkey. And uh, that's chapter basically one and two. And then in chapter three, I'm explaining how we can study that in humans, because obviously in, in humans we, we cannot put electrodes into the, the brain of people. What we do there instead is that we can uh, put people in an fMRI scanner that measures how different parts of the brain are active. And, and what you then simply do is you ask someone in the scanner to, for instance, lift the cup and pretend that he's drinking from it, so that I can map the brain regions that are active in the person that is doing it. And then I let the same person watch somebody else, like you just did, grasp a cup. I measure the brain activity that's typical for seeing somebody else. And now I can overlap these two maps, and I can see which parts of the brain are actually common to both doing something and seeing somebody else do something. And not only can I localize the parts of the brain that do that, but I can as well measure how strongly you reactivate your own actions when you see those of others. So now suddenly we can, for instance, take the cliche that men are more empathic than women, put both genders in the scanner, and see whether they indeed activate their own um, grasping for the cup program more or less than, than other people. And, and what we actually see by doing that is that uh, how empathic you are in your life actually correlates with or predicts how much you'll activate your own motor program when you see those others. So, so we start to be able to really get at what makes a single person unique in terms of how empathic you are and uh, how much they, they're activating their own motor programs in the brain while they witness the actions of others. Yeah, and then so when the, the brain regions light up uh, on the fMRI, it's kind of like in the image behind you, right? That's like yes. that's kind of like the two brains, and you're able to see what areas light up and the intensity of how they light up, and it kind of gives you insight into how the mirror neurons are are working. Exactly, in in how strongly they're working. So now you can start to to use that to understand the, some of the the, the the properties of empathy. So, so, for instance, one of the experiments I'm, I'm describing in Chapter 4 is an experiment uh, that we did to try to understand what empathy really is. So you can, you can imagine kind of two flavors to empathy. One form is that empathy really allows you to understand what is happening in the brain of someone else. So that would be almost kind of telepathically gaining access to what is happening in your brain. The alternative is that empathy is projection. So that's more kind of Freudian uh, interpretation. Actually, while I'm seeing you drink that cup of coffee, it's not the case that I really sense what goes on in you. Instead, I sense what would go on in me when I drink, and I can then use that to kind of and approximate what might be going on in you. So mind reading versus projection. And so how did we test that? Well, we did a very simple experiment in which we showed people either another human being grasping a cup, or we had an industrial robot kind of calm and grasp a cup. Now, rationally, all of us know that the robots don't really have things like intentions or sensations 
or emotions. So in a way, rationally, it should make a huge difference for us whether we see a human being take that cup, drink from it, or see a robot take that cup and drink from it. But what we saw was that it, for the brain, it actually doesn't make a difference at all. Whether you see the robot or human grasp that cup, you activate exactly the same motor programs, which are the motor programs that you would use to grasp a cup yourself. And this kind of complete mismatch between what this brain activity then looks like, which is very much like what you see here, and uh, what goes on in the brain of a robot, which looks completely different, this mismatch shows us that what the mirror system does for us is not really sensing what goes on in that other being, in that case a robot, but you project exactly how you would feel while drinking, even onto the robot. So, so, so empathy is really not sensing, but projecting onto other people. But it so happens that, that most of us feel pretty much the same thing when we grasp desperately for a cup of coffee in the morning. So that this projection most of the time gives you perfectly correct insights into other people. But it shows us that, for instance, maybe if we watch a dolphin at the dolphinarium, and, 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 and dolphins always have a bit of a smile in their face, then we might decode that is meaning that the dolphin is really happy and cheerful. And in that case, it might be a misunderstanding because humans are different from dolphins. And therefore, this projection that our mirror system kind of predisposes us to do becomes a way to misinterpret what goes on in others. So one thing I was just that's coming to my mind is here in uh, California, we have Yosemite Valley, which is this beautiful... Uh, just spectacular valley. And I, I remember a story of one of the first settlers who came and saw it, and he kind of came over this ridge and then suddenly saw the whole valley. And he, and he just had this beautiful inspiration, and he was like almost in tears, you know, seeing the grandeur of, of that valley. Does that, I was wondering, is that kind of like mirror neurons as well, that you feel, you kind of see the, this grand open valley and the spectacular, and you kind of project your own feelings, your own, you know, you're, you're feeling yourself. If I was this grand valley, what would I feel like? I, I don't know. I'm just wondering if that's... Well, it's, a, it's an interesting interpretation. I, I, I think that um, it, it's, we certainly haven't explored whether you, you, you empathize with a valley in kind of... Um, um, but it's, uh, I think what... In a way, what, uh, what this kind of chapter in my book is about is to exactly do what I've just done with you, kind of to inspire you to think of things that I have not been smart enough to think about so that you could actually go ahead and design the right experiment to test that. Because I, I think that science is really a process. And, and I'm writing this book, kind of I wrote it actually three years ago. So it, it's... An, an, I cannot tell you what the future will bring, but I hope that the book is written in a way that you can ask these questions and, and tomorrow we can test them. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, chapter four, Born to Socialize? Correct. And, and so what I then go on to do is, is kind of think about, uh, about language. So, so, so language is, if you think of, of empathy in the way that people can connect, I think that humans, uh, of course, connect a lot through language as well. I mean, so, so my daughter is now two years old, and uh, she, she can now speak. She can really, uh, in the morning, she cries when she goes to daycare and we go away. And you can now ask her, why do you cry? And she can, for the first time, really tell me why she actually cries. She tells me because, because then... I go away and, uh, and she's scared that she's not going to see me again. So that really opens, I think, my, my window into her mind in ways that I didn't have before. But, but now language is really fascinating when you think about it from the point of view of evolution because we, we, we used to, since Darwin, to think of evolution as something that happened step by step. I mean, you don't go from a fish to, to a leopard 
Right? You don't go from not having legs to being the fastest runner in the world. Usually there's a, there's a series of animals in between that have kind of a fish that can, a lung fish that can walk a little bit on their four fins. And then you, you get the different stages of evolution. You've got turtles and then eventually in small steps you get to the leopard. Now the funny thing with language is that you have on the one hand apes that really can't speak. And then the next thing you have is Shakespeare. Kind of this, uh, there's nothing really in between there. And that makes it very hard to understand how you can go from muteness to perfectly articulate uh, Shakespeare. And kind of what, what I think Marineurans do for us is that for the first time, they really show us that uh, apes and monkeys actually have a connection between them which goes through actions and it is a real four step to, uh, to, uh, to mirror neurons and uh, to, to language. And maybe what I'd like to do is show you a, a movie. So, so what you'd see in that movie is two chimpanzees. One of the chimpanzee knows how to crack a nut with a stone. And, and he's hammering onto this, uh, this nut with his stone. And in front of him, there's a, there's a juvenile uh, chimpanzee that is really trying to learn how to crack a nut. And he's just watching. But you'll see him, while he's watching, just repeat the exact movement with his hand. And it's kind of his mirror neuron that transform this uh, gesture that the other one is doing with this, uh, the anvil into his own action. But what happens here is something really special because the, the, the ape that knows how to do this had a thought in his mind. He wanted to crack this nut and he's cracking this nut. But now he can see how his idea basically was transmitted to the other ape because he can now see the other ape do the same thing. And, and by doing that, the ape can really have the experience that he can take something in his mind, kind of make a gesture and see how this basically travels into the mind of the other ape. They can communicate, transmit an idea from one ape to the other and see it happen. And I think that once you have that in place, language is no longer a mystery because you have gestural communication. They can experience how ideas go from one mind to the other by doing a gesture. And now, basically, the only thing they need to do is transform this gestural form of communication into a verbal form of communication. But language through mirror neurons is no longer this huge gap mm. that we can't understand. It becomes a little step. It's kind of you learn to mirror you use gestures to communicate the skill from one ape to the other. And now all you need to do is maybe transform sounds that you make while you're cracking into, into a kind of pseudo word, and then you're on into the street. So, so I think that's really exciting as well for people interested in language, is that we see how something that's in place in the ape brain is basically a foundation for, for language in humans. Oh, so it's that reflecting quality that becomes like a first step in, in language then, because it's exactly. creating this, it's creating a little bit of a dialogue there, right? It's like, exactly. I'm seeing you reflected in me, I can kind of get a sense if you're doing it right. And also, I think you mentioned that uh, maybe the first language might have been, like if you're out on the savanna, you would, you know, instead of saying lion, you would make the sound of a lion, you know, exactly. roar. And yes. then the other person, oh, roar. And then exactly. it's like it, the, it, it creates kind of like this foundation then. Exactly. Okay. So, so, so I think it, it's great to see how something like, like language is grounded in simpler things that we have in place already in, in monkeys and apes. Yeah, so it's the whole evolutionary quality of it that we can see how, how it would progress, how this exactly. quality would progress through uh, time and evolution. I think uh, Franz de Waal talks a lot about this too, about the, the, uh, the kind of the different aspects of empathy. Um, that yes. Different animals have different uh, levels and qualities of empathy that he uses, I think the Russian doll model yes. of, of you know, one layer of empathy on top of the other, different qualities of it, and you can see it, 
how it would evolve through uh, time. Exactly, because a, a lot of people take great pride in the fact that humans are really special. So, so, so of course, we, we used to, to believe that, uh, that we were kind of God's creation and we're really special because of that. But then uh, people kind of slowly stepped it down and they, and they believed, for instance, that our moral sentiment, the sense of justice and of doing the right thing is really something special about humans. But I take much more pride in kind of seeing that things like empathy are actually biologically founded and that there is a real continuum that we're that empathy runs very deep both in us but as well in kind of the, the time of evolution and that we can see it at work in in our closest cousins like uh, apes but uh, even in in further cousins we, we now uh, have some very nice experiments that show that rats are uh, empathic as well and, and I think given how much I think human civilization depends on our capacity to empathize with others. I, I find great comfort in, in seeing that it's not just a very fragile invention of mankind, but that it's actually uh, this very deeply biologically grounded phenomenon that we share with apes and rats. Mm, so it's, it's like, it's, uh, it's like we're, you can't kind of get away from empathy because we're wired for empathy and it also kind of makes a connection with the rest of life too. It's like we're not yes. so alienated from other from other animals. They oh, we actually have some similarities and some commonalities. Exactly, and and in things that I think are very important and valuable, like uh, caring for the welfare of somebody else, which is maybe one of the the, the grandest uh, virtues that we have seeing that we share these very grand values with, with other animals, I find is particularly uh, enriching as an experience of bonding with the, the animal kingdom. Yeah, uh, the one thing I have to ask about here, we, we're on chapter five, language, but you start off by saying blue banana with a hundred legs. What was, what was that? Oh, yes, well, well let's say, I think to the, 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 the power of language. So, I can I can tell you to think about a blue banana with a thousand legs, and and you can actually come up now with in your mind with this completely unlikely phenomenon. Basically, a blue banana with a thousand legs. You never saw one in the world, but just by communication, I can take this kind of very unlikely thought in my mind and communicate it to your mind. And I think that is something that, of course, is really special about language. It's very hard, I think, for for an ape to to uh, to create in another ape something uh, as as science fiction as a blue banana with a thousand legs. So language is really wonderful in the way that it can connect us. But it's uh, by the same time by showing how language derives from something simpler, like mirror neurons uh, in in apes. I kind of uh, hope to show a bit the continuity. So we have the continuity with the animal kingdom. And then by the same token, we, we kind of brought it to, to an interesting new dimension where we can start to transmit completely novel ideas from one person to the other. So you're kind of saying that we're, we're, we mirror each other in terms of our actions. And then it's like the foundation of, of language too. So we have a word, we say lion, and that word kind of con connects to our mirror neuron systems and we're feeling what we've seen of lions or, or the qualities of a lion. So the language kind of taps I, I, in. I think, I think maybe the, the best example is not so much a lion, but something like cracking. Hmm. So if, I, if I'm using that in a, kind of cracking a piece of wood, for instance, there you can really, so already the word crack, is basically similar to, to the sound that it makes when you crack a piece of wood. So, so you have your own experience of the effort and then the sudden moment where the wood cracks. Mm, mm -hmm. Basically, by, by using the very word that you associate as a sound with your own experience of doing that, using this word crack allows me to, to kind of take a concept I have in my mind, the intention to crack, 
and evoke in your brain all the experiences that you have associated with the action of cracking and the sound it makes itself so that you have a very kind of rich transmission of an intention, what it means, what it feels like, all through a very natural channel, which is the sound of cracking that uh, each of us individually have associated with the action because we hear what it sounds like you know, to, to crack an, a, a stick. So, so then we have a very condensed form of communication by just simulating the sound in verbal communication. We can retrieve all the richness of the intentionality, what it feels like and, and what we want to do to somebody else in a very kind of natural and simple way. Well, what really struck me there with the uh, blue banana with a hundred legs is that's kind of like can can be kind of like a metaphor as well. Um, and I've I've interviewed George Lakoff who talks about saying that metaphor is like this foundational uh, quality of, of humans that we think kind of metaphorically. So the metaphors would connect to that mirror neuron system as well. So yes. and. And then we have the ability to start putting those metaphors together, which is what you did there. The blue banana and a hundred legs is yes. maybe, and then we're kind of combining, recombining uh, these different um, uh, metaphors, which have like an experiential feel underneath them. Right. I mean, so some of the, the, the powerful metaphors are, for instance, the notion of grasping an idea. Yeah. So of course, you can't really grasp an idea, but uh, most languages use something akin to actually grasping to, uh, to, to convey the, the notion of being able to, to really take an idea of somebody else and make it yourself. And it's, it, it's kind of amazing how that rests on the simple motor program of taking something and making it your own kind of thing. Mm. So, so in that, I think there's, an, uh, and that's what my chapter on language kind of does, is it, there's very many levels at which language is deeply connected with our motor system. There's these levels in which we transform kind of abstract notions like uh, understanding an idea into something much more pragmatic in the motor system, which is reaching and taking, then there's uh, levels of really decoding the sounds of language, uh, where in the computers for a long time had huge problems just understanding what somebody was saying, the level of transforming it from the sound to the actual letters that the person was, uh, was, was pronouncing. And we slowly understood that part of how humans actually do it is by activating the muscles they would use to produce the sounds they're hearing. That really allows them to categorize then the sounds in the different uh, letters we have, because different letters involve different muscles, kind of a G is in the back of your mouth, a P is in the front of your mouth, and by mapping it onto the right muscles, they suddenly become very different, they feel very different. And so, so there's all these different levels, and, and I think they're really, you, you get out of that chapter being almost amazed, I think, at, at how many levels of similarity we have between our motor system and our capacity to, to speak. Uh, yeah, so it really, and it starts with that, that mirroring, those mirror neurons as being so foundational then uh, for that. And, and the, it, it opens up a whole <laughs> level, level after level. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. So then you went to uh, chapter six, which was uh, sharing emotions. And yes. I think that was part of your research, too. I mean, in, in Italy, I mean, when they discovered neurons, it was all about motor, the motor exactly. neurons. And you actually made the transition from motor neurons to um, the feeling and emotions. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so, so, so in, the, in the monkey, the, the whole thing started because the team in Parma was interested in understanding the motor system. So they had a clear interest in the motor system. And then they understood that while we see the actions of others, we map it onto our own actions. But I think that if you take anyone in the street and ask them what empathy is about, very few of them would tell kind of that uh, empathy is doing what you see other people do. 
most people would say that empathy is about feeling what other people feel. And, and so there we were, kind of understanding how you map actions of others onto your own actions. And at the same time, everybody thinking that empathy is mainly about emotions. So basically, what, what I then did was trying to take, uh, together with colleagues of mine, this notion that we understood well in terms of the brain of, of mirror neurons for actions and test whether it might uh, work for emotions as well. And, and you can imagine one of the big challenges to study emotions is actually to, to induce them in human beings while you can study what happens in the brain. So I can put you in a scanner and tell you to be happy for 10 seconds, but it's not going to work very well. So, so what we did was we put people in a scanner and put an anesthesia mask on their face and ask you, why do I get an anesthesia mask? And, and you tell them, well, just wait a bit, you're going to find out soon enough. And, and, and then what we did was we showed them first movies in which they'd see someone sniff at the glass and either reacting disgusted or, for instance, reacting pleased about the drink. So, so now for you, it's very easy to know which of these two cups of coffee you'd rather drink afterwards, but how does it happen in the brain? And, and that's when they find out why they have this anesthesia mask, because we now start to puff either very pleasant smells in there, and they figure, gee, this is not too bad, or we switch to, to something really disgusting, which is butyric acid or for a market tan that smells like rotten eggs. And, and one of our subjects started vomiting, so we had to take him out of the scanner. Mm -hmm. But for the, the others, we could now measure what the brain looks like while it's really being disgusted, and then what it looks like while it sees the disgust of somebody else. And for the first time, we could see that what we had seen in the motor system also applies to emotions. We could see that a part of the brain that we call the insula which is really responsible for allowing you to feel disgusted and, and giving you this urge to vomit, that this very embodied representation of your own emotions becomes active each time you see somebody else go through disgust. So, so then we really opened up this notion of mirroring from actions to emotions and suddenly saw that also when you see the emotions of others, you don't just activate representation of, of, of emotional facial expressions in your motor system, but you also associate this feeling of, of, of feeling sick to your own stomach that now allows you to go deeper than the skin. You no longer just see the disgusted facial expression, but you really feel what you would feel like in the same situation. Mm. So it's it's like tapping into your ex past experience of disgust, maybe a little nausea or or kind of, exactly. and, and that's taking it down into the rest of your body and um, absolutely, and, and, and it's kind of spreading it, right? That's kind of like nausea exactly. is maybe a spreading uh, felt feeling through the whole body. I, I mean, this this metaphor that people think is a metaphor of saying, "Gee, that uh, made me sick to my stomach." is actually we can measure that almost. If you stimulate that part of the, the insula, you can measure that people's stomach is actually con constructing and, and, and is literally moving. So that we show that if you see the disgust of someone else, you don't just abstractly realize that person is disgusted, but it can go all the way into your body. It can start moving your own stomach in ways for you to share what goes on in the other in a very deep and embodied uh, way. And uh, what I also describe in that uh, chapter is a very fascinating case of a patient that uh, because of a brain disease lost that part of his insula. And what you see is that this patient loses his own sense of disgust. So if you give him something really unpleasant to drink, he'll drink it and he's not going to feel any nausea. But the other thing is that if you show him a photo of a happy person, he can tell you that person is happy. But if you show him a photo of a disgusted person, because he lost his own sense of disgust, he's no longer able to really understand that somebody else is going through disgust. So it kind of deconstructs empathy in saying that the empathy is not this one brain function, but it's a mosaic of different things. 
And for the particular capacity to understand disgust in others, you need your own capacity of disgust. To understand the actions of others, you need a different brain region that's responsible for your own actions. So, so, so we really have this rich understanding of others because we have so many things that represent so many aspects of our own experiences. And each one of them can kind of resonate with what other people go through, creating this very rich, multi-model uh, experience of really slipping into the skin of the other person. Well, it's so interesting how you're able to tease all this out, you know, with with kind of having to create experiments that, you know, take one factor and remove it and add another factor and you're able to kind of see kind of the mechanics of, and it kind of uh, makes you, you know, some people say that, well, mirror neurons aren't established fact yet or something like that. How, how do you kind of respond to that is? Well, that is, uh, the, 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 it, it always surprises me how little these people actually read because there uh, are now in, in experiments in which in uh, epileptic patients, so if you, certain forms of epilepsy are so severe that no drug can cure it. And they then go to neurosurgeons like Itzhak Fried, for instance, in, in, uh, in LA, to, to ask the surgeon to take out the part of the brain that is causing the epilepsy. And, and neurosurgeons like that, before just taking out the part, they put electrodes in these parts of the brain to really find out whether it really starts from there. And if they do that, you have the chance to, even in humans, record from single neurons. And by doing that, they were able to record from neurons in humans that uh, are active both when the human does an action like grasping a cup and while he sees somebody else grasp a cup. Or in, uh, when people do a facial emotion, facial expression or see the facial expression of others. So this came after the foundational work we did, of course, in, in monkeys. And for a while, it was just speculation. But by now, we have uh, absolute proof of the fact that humans have mirror neurons as well. So it's more kind of idle uh, talk rather <laughs> than actual fact. Well, in, in that chapter, you have uh, the... Uh which looks interesting is uh, the poker face uh, quality of which is I guess is hiding emotions like how does how does yes. that kind of work I mean that's kind of an interesting kind of an aspect of of mirror neurons is how are you actually kind of hiding your you exactly. know what's going on inside yourself so so they you have again just to think about the fact that of course mirror neurons are not magic. It's not like I can feel your emotions directly in any way. The, the only way that I can actually sense your emotions is because you make some kind of reaction to it, be it in the face or in the body. Now, this reaction, I can map onto my own motor system. I can kind of internally repeat what you've done. And then I know that when I do this, I have a certain emotion attached to that, so I can then decode that emotion I normally feel. So through your actual reactions, I can associate kind of these inner hidden states. Now, if you control your own facial expressions, of course, you, you deprive me of the very food that mirror neurons need to basically get to your inner feelings. And if you, 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 you're very good at it, you, you put up a complete uh, poker face, you, you don't show anything of what goes on in you, then you completely deprive me of the capacity to, to do that, of course. Yeah, so in terms of uh, deepening uh, uh, an empathic connection, that kind of shows the importance of revealing yourself. Absolutely. So that's, that's really quite a beautiful, and that that that's, uh, ties into relationships too, right? In a couple. Absolutely. If a couple want a deeper relationship, it's so important to reveal yourself so you have something for the other person to work with. And exactly. I mean, some, some, uh, in some couples, you get this thing where, where one of the partners is really upset that the other partner never knows what present to give them for Christmas. Well, just make sure that the, the weeks before, you, while you run in front of, uh, of the different stores, you, you really express how much you like certain things and how much you dislike some of the others. And then you'll see that your partner will become much more cunning. I think <laughs> it's really kind of a give and take 
it's uh, like you say, I think that the accuracy of the connection between people has as much to do with the skills of the observer than with the skills of the sender. That the more clearly and unfilteredly you let your emotions come to the surface, the less lonely you'll feel because you, you give people now the capacity to, to really feel what goes on in you and, and, and react uh, accurately to it. So, so, so like you say, it's, it's really something we, we need to, to deal with is that the, the, the more we reveal our own emotions, actually, the more we connect to other people as well. Okay, that was uh, chapter six, um, and we have uh, chapter seven, sensation, seeing touch is literally touching and why it hurts to damage your car, or a few of the... Yes, so, so here we've, uh, so we had actions in the beginning, then we, we went to emotions, and finally we went to, to sensations as well. And, and what we see is that if you just see somebody do something like I'm doing right now, you're actually activating parts of your brain that are normally sensing touch on your own body. And if I slap this hand, you, you'll activate um, pain regions in, in your own brain. And what we see, strangely enough, is that if I replace this uh, hand with a, with a book, my, my book for that <laughs> Conveniently. <laughs> it's a great book. <laughs> and, and, you, and I'm now showing you kind of something touching this book, you'll as well actually activate your own somatosensory cortex to some extent as if you'd be touched yourself. Kind of showing that it's not just the social world that we understand by empathy, but that we to some extent generalize that to the inanimate world as well. And that helps us understand, in a way, why sometimes kind of, for instance, seeing a car reverse and just scratch along a pole by mistake can kind of literally make yeah. you shiver a bit as if you, you, it'd be physically painful. It's kind of because we have such a strong mirror system, I think we use it as well to kind of feel and feel sorry about what happens to objects as well. And kind of understanding that kind of helps you understand as well why you sometimes have these irrational reactions to, 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 to your scratching your MacBook Pro or whatever you, you, you really like about, uh, about your own belongings. But I think that having that is, is as well important for, for culture because if we wouldn't care to kind of protect our objects, we, we, we wouldn't be able to, to build up the, the, the great kind of... Uh, at civilizations we have, where we have so many valuable tools as well. So it kind of, in a way, equips us not just to understand other people, but as well to be able to, to be caring about tools and objects that then become really pressures to, to build up a, a whole civilization. Yeah, so we kind of connect, it's showing how we connect our emotions uh, to, the, uh, to, to the, the world around us, to the yes. objects around us. It, Exactly. And, and I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of religions actually have a much more um, integrative approach where kind of God is in everything and, and everything deserves your empathy, be it a, a, a worm or, or even just a, a vegetable. And, and I think that we see that our brain is actually to some extent uh, kind of predisposed to, to have that. And, and then some of the other issues I explore, I think, in this chapter on sensations and pain, which I think are really interesting, is some of the gender differences. So, so you have the cliche, for instance, that men are empathic and women, uh, that men are not empathic and women are. But uh, some, some very nice experiments on pain, I think, really refined the cliche and revealed something interesting. So, so in one of these studies that Tanya Zinger did, what she did is she had men and women enter the lab. And the first thing that would happen is that they do a little game with two other people. One of these other people is really going to be unfair to them and keeps all the money. The other one is going to be really nice and will always share the money with them. And then what happens in the second part is you put them in the scanner and you show them either the fair or the unfair person get electroshocks. And what you see is that in women, 
It doesn't matter whether they see the fair or the unfair one get the electroshock. They'll activate their own pain in both cases. When men did that, they activated their own pain when they saw their friends get the, the electroshocks. But if they saw the unfair one get electroshocks, they actually activated pleasure areas in, instead of, uh, of pain areas. And what's interesting about that is that it shows that when it comes to your friends, male and female, actually equally empathic. It's, uh, it's not a difference in capacity for empathy. But what really seems to happen is that the way that relationships, fairness, and, and those kind of things modulates how much you empathize, men start to become very different. And, and now if you think about why, for instance, we send our men to war and not our females to war, it becomes very interesting to realize that if you tell a man, for instance, that this enemy is a really terrible person, very unfair and different from you, men will actually not feel so much empathy anymore. And if they then have to hurt the other person, they're not going to suffer that much from feeling the pain. If you send a woman in the same situation, she will still feel a lot of empathy towards the enemy. And, and hurting the enemy will become something that's psychologically very hard to deal with. So, so I think that some of these differences that, that, that have good reasons in evolution maybe to come about really shape the way that, um, that we have to, to deal with psychological distress, for instance, in war for, for male and female. And, and they also help us understand a bit why dictators, before they try to set up a genocide, really try to make people believe that this other group is very, very different and is uh, very, very kind of unfair. Kind of, if you listen to, to what uh, kind of Hitler did uh, about the Jews, basically, it was all about that, showing that they're very different and showing that they're, they're kind of very mean and unfair. And by doing that, he was leveraging the kind of uh, mechanisms we all seem to have in our brain to reduce empathy when we are men, at least, towards people that are unfair. And once you've downregulated that with propaganda, it becomes a lot easier to actually motivate the, the, the people to hurt others. And the positive message is that the other way around, if you emphasize the similarities we all have uh, with other human beings, you might be able to increase people's empathy for, for others and, and really create this culture of empathy that we're all about, and where, where you now start to really care about what happens to others because their pain becomes your pain, and because their joy becomes your joy. Yeah, well, that's what the beauty of the mirror neurons is for me, is that it shows biologically how this works, so that we can actually study and find ways of, of increasing empathy and understanding what uh, diminishes it, and create interventions you know, to uh, support creating more empathy within society. Absolutely. So, so by understanding that our brain empathizes less with people we think are different or have been unfair to us, I don't think that we should take that to mean, okay, well, then it's okay to be uh, less empathic to other people. But what it does do is it shows us where the lever is, and, and, and it basically gives us a manual of how we can increase empathy or, or reduce it. And, and I think that in, in the kind of uh, economic crisis we are in right now, it really reveals two routes that politicians can go. I mean, the easy route is to say, kind of, if you're, if you're the British Prime Minister, just to speak, that the, say that the Eurozone countries are in a deep problem and they should deal with it. Or you can say, kind of, we are all in an economical crisis and we all need to deal with it. And, and by making this difference, you're either kind of uh, you know, washing your hands from the problem or you're creating, I think, really the spirit of community that will be key to us working shoulder to shoulder to really solve the problem. And, and I think that's what we can do as scientists is show the politicians where, where the more meaningful solution would be. But then, of course, it's their choice to, to do it or not to some extent. Yeah. 
Well, um, we've gone for about an hour, and we've gone yes. to about chapter eight. And I don't want to keep you longer because I know you've got schedules and and all that. So, um, so we could uh, maybe wrap it up here. And so we went to chapter eight, and I think there's uh, eleven chapters. So, and the the book is online, so it can be downloaded for a very nominal cost as well. And I think it's a wonderful book. I read it the second time uh, just before this interview. So, That's very kind of you. Yeah, I got I got a lot out of it because I really love the you know the um, the physical mechanistic part of it, how it works. And I know a lot of women that I talk to, you know. Like I have the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, it's probably seventy percent women who are kind of you know signing up on our Facebook page. But I did talk to some, uh, one of them who said I started talking to my boyfriend about mirror neurons. You know, the men think, "Oh, this is all woo woo stuff." Yeah. I started talking to him about mirror neurons, and suddenly he was interested. It all made sense <laughs> to him. So it's like you know, the men, baby, you know, generalization here, but they like you know, the, the, how things really work, and then it makes it more real. So I think this really uh, does that, that contributes in, in to that. Well, it's great. Yeah. So, so, so I think the, the, at, at the very end of the book, of course, I'm, I'm not trying to say that humans are good because they have mirror neurons, because I think that that would be too simple a message, because we can use mirror neurons for good things, but as well for bad things, for manipulating others. But, but I think that the, the study of mirror neurons really shows us two things. One is, like you say, that empathy and our connection between people is not just the voodoo stuff. It's very real and we can understand it. And the other thing is that by understanding the nuts and bolts of it, I think we really point to how we can make the best out of it. And I think that's uh, that's what uh, what gets me really excited about these studies as well. It's not just about understanding how the brain works for the brain's sake, but for how it enriches our understanding of of the very nature of of our social interactions. Yeah, and you mentioned too that for you it's like a sense of poetry. The uh, that the uh, this whole study and, and how it works and how empathy works is really kind of has a poetic kind of a quality to it. Absolutely. It's a bit like the, the beauty of a of a rose. I think what makes it so beautiful is that it was really created by nature and it's kind of there and we can look at it and and the more we look at it, the more we, we, we can find it beautiful. And I think that uh, by, by looking at how elegantly the brain connects us with each other i think you, you get out not with what people typically uh, associate with a with a kind of reductionist approach that at the end it's not beautiful anymore because you're just lost in the details but quite the opposite is the deeper you go into it and the more you see how elegantly i think and strongly we're interconnected and, and i think that's for me the poetry of of that kind of brain science well, uh, Christian, thank you so much for having taken the time to uh, kind of run through your book and share your, your time. And I look forward to kind of staying in contact and hearing how your, your wonderful work there in, in Amsterdam in Holland uh, progresses. Absolutely. And I'm uh, looking forward to see how, how the whole culture of empathy will, will continue to hopefully really flourish in, in the next days. I think we're at a time in history where, where we really need a sense of, of, of human, of worldwide community that, that empathy can really create to, to tackle all of the big issues that we now have, none of which kind of a small group of people will ever solve, be it kind of the problem of, of, of the environment or, or now of the, the economical crisis, unless we all kind of get this feeling that we need to work together, we, we're not going to get to the end of that. Okay, thank you so much. I look forward to uh, talking to you again sometime. It was great. Yes. Bye. Bye. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.